Welcome to In Doubt Checkout, Dialogue with Dr. Nandini Mundkur, where we delve into many facets of childhood and their development. I'm Manju Bhargavi, Head of Sangamitra Early Learning and Sensory Integration Center, your host on this journey of understanding children. Today's topic is on demystifying autism. Autism, often misunderstood and mispresented, deserves a spotlight where its complexities can be explored with compassion and clarity. In each episode, we'll break down stereotypes, challenge misconceptions and invite experts, advocates and individuals on the spectrum themselves to share their stories, insights and expertise. Whether you're a parent seeking support, a professional striving for deeper understanding or simply someone curious about the diverse experiences within the autism community, this podcast aims to offer valuable perspectives and foster a more inclusive society. So like, share and subscribe to our channel and press the notification button for more updates. So join me as we navigate through the realms of autism, one conversation at a time. Together, let's demystify autism and embrace the richness it brings to our world. To help us demystify autism, we have with us Dr. Nandini Munkur, developmental pediatrician who has done pioneering work in the field of early detection and intervention services for developmental disorders for more than three decades now. She is the founder director of Center for Child Development with Disabilities and Sangamitra Early Learning and Sensory Integration Center, Bangalore. Dr. Nandini Mundkor also co-founded Tots Guide, a comprehensive online self-educated portal aimed to cater to the vision of helping every child with disabilities to attain a better future. Doctor, I welcome you for the podcast. Thank you. It shall be my endeavor to build knowledge on evidence-based practices along with my clinical experience so that parents can make informed decisions regarding their child with autism spectrum disorder. Thank you. Before we dive into today's episode, I want to take a moment to thank our sponsor, Mr. Akmal Jan from Carpet Kingdom. Carpet Kingdom, Bangalore and Chennai are acknowledged destinations for their finest rugs and carpets to be found anywhere. It's a family enterprise of five generations over 125 years. They customize, design and manufacture carpets and rugs as per the client's vision. They advocate for inclusivity and provide support for children with special needs by offering them opportunities to explore and display their artistic talents, which are then translated into designs for rugs and carpets. Art from Heart initiative is to provide a platform to young children with special needs to bring in their creativity. They have organized an art festival on the 30th March of this year to identify such talents. We are truly grateful for their support as it allows us to continue bringing you the insights of Dr. Mundkur and her expertise. Now let's get back to the show. Doctor, the very first question on today's podcast of demystifying autism. What is autism? Autism is a neurobiological disorder affecting social interaction, characterized by repetitive behavior and impaired communication, especially social communication. It is known as autism spectrum disorder because the severity of this condition varies from mild to severe. What does uh, social communication and interaction mean? And at what age will social communication start with children? Social interaction is communication between two or more individuals. Social development is a process by which a child learns to interact with others and establish a relationship. During this process, child will understand their own feelings and emotions and of others. They develop skills like cooperation, communication, empathy and build a meaningful relationship to be in the social world. The example, the newborn, will show its emotions by crying when it's required and it'll quieten when the mother picks up. By four months, 
they will have a soon they will have social smile they will start having social games they'll play peekaboo game with you and by nine months they'll point to what they want so on and so forth they keep on developing their uh, social skills and understanding as they grow up so social communication helps a child to understand who they are and what their feelings are and the very important thing as social relationship the second aspect of social communication is called social cognition or social intelligence. Now, what does this mean is to understand others' mind and convey what is in their mind. This can be done both non-verbal communication like gestures or verbally. Doctor, you also mentioned about repetitive behaviors as we were talking. What are repetitive behaviors? Repetitive are called stereotypical behaviors like these children will have flicking their fingers, rocking, spinning, head banging, moving their hands in front of their faces, you know, they will snap their fingers, they can line up toys and they can also have other, they'll keep on repeating. Like instead of answering a question, if you ask them, what is your name? They'll say, what is your name? Where are you going? Where are you going? It's also called echolalia. And they'll keep on repeating. Sometimes they would have heard something long ago, but they will keep repeating it. Oh, it's raining today. Nobody asked them. Or oh, neither it is raining. But these are repetitive phases these children have. That These are called stereotypic behavior or repetitive behaviors. And these are very, very characteristics of children with autism. Doctor, how early can parents identify autism? We have to monitor social milestones to identify autism early, you know. Social milestones are hidden. Unlike the physical milestones like sitting, standing, walking, which is easily seen. Now the parents will be so worried if the child does not walk by a year and a half. And they'll go running to their doctors. But they don't bother if the child does, doesn't respond to their name or not having a social smile, not enjoying social interaction because they're not obvious to the eye. So that is why the social milestone should be monitored if you have to discover autism earlier. Doctor, as we see that uh, these children look very normal, they, are, they look like any other children, they don't have any kind of physical difficulties. Why is it so difficult to accept them or to identify them as different? You said the answer yourself. These children look so normal that parents have no reason to look at them and find something is wrong. Further, the pregnancy is not marked mm -hmm. with any kind of problems by which the, you know, like they go to a neonatal unit and the baby is in the NICU and then they come out of it and the parents are worried. These be babies are full term, normal, deliver and they are, so they have no reason to suspect something is going wrong. The third thing is, as I told you, monitoring social skills, which is a major deficit in these children, is not very obvious to the eye. So they don't monitor that. Then the fourth, I feel, is elders in the house who often dissuade young parents seeking help, even if they find out that these, you know, like social skills are not developing all right. And our culture is quite authoritarian. We, it's very difficult for us to overcome the elders' views and seek for help. And that's why, you know, these children invariably are diagnosed when they go to school. When they're not interacting with the other children, they're not learning, they're not performing. That's a time when they come for uh, opinion, you know. So these are some of the reasons why we don't really diagnose these cases early. And I think each of these children also go to a developmental pediatrician or pediatricians for their regular visits. Yeah. I think it must have been identified early there too, right? Well, according to the Indian Academy of Pediatrics, all of us, all develop pediatrician, not developmental pediatrician, in fact, every doctor, because in the districts and yeah, have to do something called an MCHAT at 18 months of age, which is a screening questionnaire available in several Indian languages to really suspect whether this child could fall into the diagnosis come later. At least screening is absolutely mandatory. Okay. However, it's not done in our country. Mm -hmm. See, uh, I think uh, a pediatrician, for example, sees 60 to 70 children in an OPD, you know, and he doesn't ask for these questions. And even I feel there's something called well baby clinic there and where they really do only immunization. It is at that time that they, they should look for this condition and, you know, screen it. But it is really not done. 
at least I feel if parents were to suspect something is wrong and they probably convey it to the doctor, he might take a little more interest and, take, and do a screening. But I must say that we have to do a lot more awareness building in this condition which is rising exponentially that if we have to diagnose early, even the doctors do not really, really take this seriously. And I think we should request them to do so from now onwards. Yeah, that's very true. Because when we were going to school or yeah. college, yeah. Uh, we did not hear about these conditions too. Yeah. Now we are hearing it more often, more often in the neighbors or in the schools. So is it true that there is a raise in the cases of autism? Yes, there is a rise because one is a diagnostic criteria and capabilities have improved a lot so there's a better awareness to we do also there are some environmental factors like genetic factors and uh, the environment toxins they are contributing to this in the last 10 years the condition has tripled Okay. It, in the U.S. is saying that is one in 34 children are diagnosed with autism in the U.S. Okay. and perhaps one in 100 in the rest of the world. That means 1% of the population. According to American statistics, in 2004, it was one in 125 children. Okay. In 14, it was one in 59. In 2018, they're saying one in 44. Okay. In 2023, they're saying one in 34. So isn't there an exponential rise in these children? Almost okay. like a silent epidemic. You know, we'd be very worried with COVID. Yes. But nobody is bothering about autism, which is rising, rising, rising. And uh, if we don't really take this into cognizance, we're going to have a number of children who are going to have a lot of problems, you know. And then there is also, I want to tell you, there is an attempt going on. There's a lot of research going on in the neuroscience and neuroscience community as to what is the reason for this. They're trying to look into genetics, they're looking into how the epigenetics is in the epigenetic means, how the environment is affecting this condition, they're looking into biomarkers, if there's anything which is available by which we can knock out the gene or any biomarkers we can, or they're looking into a lot of gut, you know, uh, microbiota is coming in a big way. There is a lot of uh, research going on from the medical and the scientific community. There is also a great endeavor by the social people. The mm -hmm. social the social community advocacy group wants to rehabilitate these children into the inclusive society because they feel this is not a disease. Mm -hmm. This is a disorder and it's a different wiring in the brain. So why should they be penalized? Why can't mm -hmm. the general population adapt and keep them? So there is a, so both are trying to really let it try very hard to get this child into productivity. Uh, as I as I see, there is uh, there is uh, April coming up soon, and uh, uh, according to my knowledge, I think April second every year is celebrated as World Autism Day. Can you share a brief uh, insight into it? Every year on April second from two thousand and eight, it is celebrated as a World Autism Awareness Day. The United Nations and 2007 December passed a resolution actually and this ran without any vote wow. bringing awareness that this condition needs attention so the whole month is celebrated as world autism awareness month you know and autism awareness day is on April 2nd every year the autism awareness month has a theme mm -hmm. and like last year it was uh, home policy, working policy, make what is going to be decided in uh, the workplaces and how mm -hmm. to include it, include them. This year, it is actually called the strategic development goals for this year. Now, what are these strategic development goals? It is including this child in building good health, well-being, quality education, inclusion, equitable society, for all this, that is what is a theme for this. So ideally, <clears throat> to build an inclusive society and build empowerment for them. Well, your theme of this year, of yes. what you're trying to do with the Carpet Kingdom, is on the same, same goal. goal. Yes, that's true. Doctor, um, yes, as we have looked into uh, details of autism, uh, along with autism, there are numerous misconceptions that are surrounding uh, I request you to 
dispel these myths and promote accurate information about autism so that we can create more inclusive and understanding societies for the individuals with autism and their families. Now myth number one. Families say boys talk late and how is this related? It's not true. Boys are, first of all, far more susceptible than girls. 3 is to 1 or 4 is to 1 is the ratio of developing autism. They don't speak late. Because of the little bit of higher testosterone, by few months they may speak. But it's not that for years together the boys don't speak and they're saying boys speak late. That is not true. The second aspect is that uh, they also, you know, uh, they catch up their milestones pretty easily. And uh, and also the parents think that the boys speak. It is not true. And uh, there's something called late bloomers. Mm -hmm. The late bloomers are, they start speaking by 18 to 30 months. Okay. So if, that, if you're not doing by that time, then better not wait whether it's a boy or a girl. Okay, so it means that girls don't uh, get into the autism sector? Oh, girls also have autism. But the, unfortunately, now girls don't get so much importance. They don't <laughs> even bring true. them to the doctor. You know, they think everything is all right and uh, she's on her own. <laughs> that's, one, that's one major reason. And secondly, they're a little more flirty going hither, thither and enjoying themselves. And they look so pretty, they don't even look at them to think that something could be wrong with these girls. <laughs> that's true. Doctor, myth number three. <laughs> this is, I think, the common myth which is surrounding the whole um, whole society. Once my child goes to a normal school, my child will be all right. Wow. He will be out of autism. How is it true? <laughs> going to school is for learning. It is not going to build your de defect in social interaction. The child has to have social interaction before it goes to a school, you know. This can be addressed first and this should be addressed first rather before the child goes to school. The under, I feel, you see, the child should have certain prerequisites before it enters the school. They're very simple, four or five prerequisites, I think, should be, they should have some communication skills an attention span of at least three to four minutes to go to a task mm -hmm. and self-regulation what is self-regulation take care of at least a little bit of toilet indication they need and social interaction to at least tolerate another child and have a parallel play if they're so aloof and they not interacting with anyone how is this child going to learn on the contrary if the if there is a lot of gap between this, where the child is in this, you can develop a lot of anxiety in these children mm -hmm. when you send them to school because autism have so many other problems like sensory issues and the other children can be very, very overwhelming on these kids. Mm -hmm. So one really has to send the child to school when it's ready. It's more harmful than it's beneficial really too. That's right. Uh, that, that, that's, that's so true. When parents don't have acceptance for the condition and don't understand the condition, they tend to tend to take uh, decisions on their own. Now, there are some parents who also keep uh, calling their child has a unique skills like Einstein or they have parents also quote that their child have these seven skills. So to say that their child can do many, many things and hence they also say that autism is curable or their child also can get into a better life as an Einstein or anybody else. How does this? Okay, some autism children have savant tendencies. They're very high functioning uh, children, especially in mathematics, music, reading. But that is not enough to be in the society. Mm -hmm. They will do at their whims and fancies, you know. Yes, they can use, the parents should encourage and use the savant skills to the advantage of building a career for them or, you know, bringing out their best in them. But many children with autism spectrum disorder have a lower IQ than normal. Mm -hmm. Most of them are 70 and below. So they these are very few, maybe 15 to 20 percent of children who may have some savant tendencies, but really majority of them really require help. And uh, how is that going to help? If you, you can nurture a savant tendency, mm -hmm. but other things like building social interaction, getting them communication skills, all that has to be done. Uh, 
Doctor, uh, I hear from some of uh, these organizations or some of the support groups or it keeps coming on Facebook here and there. Uh, there are some quotes which say that autism can be detected early in pregnancy, like how Down syndrome and other disabilities are detected. Is it how far is this true? No, so far there is no evidence of detecting this in early in pregnancy like autism because he, in Down syndrome we know exactly what chromosome is going wrong. Mm -hmm. Where is it going wrong? Mm -hmm. Here it they don't know. There are hundred odd chromosomes, I mean sorry, genes involved in autism. They're not able to zero on. You know, they're trying their best but so far there are no uh, kind of uh, the, uh, genetic testing, which I can say this is autism. No, there are any imaging techniques like fMRI or MRI and to do in the mother and say that, okay, this this is autism. That's not true. We, we have no such uh, facilities so far. Okay. Uh, doctor, one more common myth. Uh, parents feel that some of the vaccinations which are given to children uh, at the age of two, two and a half, or maybe early in their ages, are one of the causes for autism? No. This myth was dispensed long ago. It was mm -hmm. uh, some time ago, there was number of research which came out and said the vaccines are responsible. But a lot of research, a lot of what we, we I mean, scientists call meta-analysis. That is, when we study a lot of research papers and then come to a conclusion, it has been proved beyond doubt that vaccines are not responsible for autism. Oh, that's great. Doctor, one more, um, the current concern. Uh, young couples getting married at their late years uh, and then childbearing obviously is at a later part of their life. So some of the myths also say that late childbearing also can lead to autism. How far is this true? Uh, there may be some truth in it, but not really true. Advanced paternal age they okay. is supposed to be associated, shows a higher percentage of children. But not that 100% of a paternal <laughs> age is causing this. It's just that it's a little more. So they are studying at uh, the father's age as one of them, you know. Although it's a mother whose gen genes are responsible for the autism. Okay. <laughs> so often it's also said that uh, if uh, my first child is an autistic child, the second child also has autism. Is it true? No, approximately 10% of the second child is at the risk. Mm -hmm. And if they are identical twins, then 60 to 90%. If one twin has uh, features of childhood ASD, the other one could have. Mm -hmm. Then... 34% in the same sex, if one girl the second, and 18% uh, if it's one boy and another girl, if it is, uh, that is fraternal twins, as they call it. And if there are more than two children with autism in a family, then there is a risk of 35% of the third child also being in the spectrum. Oh, okay. Um, doctor, another interesting myth. Uh, stem cell therapies are told to be treating autism and they have people say that stem cell therapy can treat autism. This is so sad when we don't even know what is causing autism. It How can stem cell cure autism? There is all research have been contrary to this belief. Stem cell do not cure autism. Mm -hmm. Doctor, now that we have seen so many myths, one more myth from my end. Uh, is autism curable? Or will a child with autism, uh, like how parents say that every child going to a school will be normal, can an autistic child also be as normal as another child? See, autism exists even in adults. Okay. Autism is manageable. If the child is given a good intervention, it can live in the society, it can manage its affairs, it can do many things. They may have savant tendencies, but it is not curable. The problem is because of the severity, if, if severe and moderately severe children with autism tend to have many other complications, which needs to be managed. But it is a manageable condition like any other condition, but it is not really curable. Okay, so another myth, fewers of schooling and uh, being with neurotypical children, the IQ keeps increasing and the child will outgrow autism? Actually, it's the other way around. The gap 
of the IQ will increase rather than decrease with the children. It, you know, that is if it really manage well. For example, if I have a child who is five years old and functioning, say, at, at say, two years level, if he's 20 years old, he will probably be functioning around six or seven years. Oh. So this gap of this is going to increase. It depends really on the baseline and the trajectory. It has a trajectory to go. You cannot, uh, because it is, the child is at six years level, IQ has not increased. You have to see the child is 20 years old. What is IQ? IQ is the functioning of the present level of the child on the chronological age multiplied by 100. Mm -hmm. See, if you do that, then how is, I mean, IQ going to increase? It's, it's going to really decrease. But what is it? The, the capability of the child may be like a six or seven year old. Mm -hmm. Have I, have I made my clear, yes, self clear yes. on that? So, so it means that uh, every child on the spectrum, yeah. wherever they are, will need a little bit of monitoring throughout. Of and course. will need a little more uh, intervention strategies too to help yeah. them. Yeah. And uh, this will be there with them for a lifetime. Yeah. Right? And yeah. I think parents have to really understand and accept that. Dr. Another myth, um, medications can cure autism. There are many people who quote that the, there is an ABCD medicine, there's an XYZ medicine and take this and your child is out of autism. How far is this true? See, there are no medication today, available today, let's put it, to address the core symptoms of autism. It can help in some behavioral problems. It can have help when the child develops psychiatric comorbidities as it grows up. But there is no medicine available by which they can take it and the autism will disappear. Mm -hmm. okay. So sorry about that. <laughs> okay. So I think that's a lot of information for today, doctor. Thank you for sharing your valuable oh, insights my pleasure. And in, the, in the today's podcast. Uh, your expertise has truly enriched our podcast and our listeners' experience. And listeners... Do join us for the next time as we explore the criteria of assessment and the most popular and globally approved intervention programs for autism. Get ready for another enlightening discussion that's sure to spark curiosity and inspire new perspectives. Take care till we meet next.